claims that it is bloating the votes BC insists that its register is credible and transparent. This follows consent raised over the illegal transfer of voters during the just-ended voter exhibition. All our processes are transparent, inclusive and open to the political parties and the citizenry. Nothing is hidden. Our elections are concerned. Therefore, the suggestion that the peace and the outcome of the election is hinged on the chairperson of the Electoral Commission is completely untrue. High Court has ordered victims of the Tichima South electoral violence a total of 270,000 cities as compensation for violation of their rights and legal fees incurred during trial. This was after the court presided over by Justice Frederick Narura found that their right to life and dignity had been breached. <music> Residents of Cape Coast have called for immediate solution to save the country's water. Three has been monitoring the effect of Ghana Water Company Limited on recent is due to Galamse. <laughs> The water that flows through are polluted. Customers fetch and throw it away. But the meter is also reading. We always run at a loss. The lack of equipment and the use of obsolete ones are impeding far fighting operations in Ghana. This has once again exposed the deficiencies plaguing the Ghana National Fire Service in its recent management of the Makola Zongo Lane Inferno in Accra. It's not been easy. You know, who wouldn't want to finish this fire and go home and rest? It's not, we don't take pride in being here for two days. But then we are committed that no matter what, until the fire is totally extinguished, we are not going. <laughs> The Kulubu Teaching Hospital has announced the resumption of elective surgeries following the completion of work on its 40 elevator. Management of the hospital, in an interview with TV3, said most of the 40 elevators would be placed with new ones by the first quarter of 2025. So within uh, the first quarter of next year, we'll have a brand new lift to complement. When we finish with that, then we'll move on to the second one. And then we'll do that throughout the hospital so that... Uh, uh, in no time, we'll have all the lifts in place. Well, there's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next... What's the verdict on government's fight against illegal mining? Golik Dalam say that's the question we're asking tonight. What's your verdict based on the evidence that we're seeing right now when it comes to the fight against illegal mining in this country? That's a conversation shortly. And what you're seeing on your screen is just one of many, many um, rivers that have been polluted. And right now, the Ghana Water Company Limited is also faced with the threat of a number of their treatment plants broken down as a result of the high turbidity of the waters that they are having to purify for us or to, to drink or to use in our homes. That's the other threat that we face with us as well. But it is no secret that illegal mining activities continue to cause devastation in many parts of the country and its effect on people and then the environment have been dialed despite the government attempt to clamp down on, on the menace. Now, there are a number of areas of impact of illegal mining, not just on the water bodies or the forest cover, the depletion of a forest cover, but now the Ghana Water Company is also feeling the direct impact of illegal mining over the period. A number of their treatment plants have broken down as a result. It's led to an increase in the cost of production of the, these, uh, the water that we also and using our homes. My colleague Balamundi saw this firsthand uh, when she, she 
we took a trip to, to the central region. And uh, I just want to show you briefly some of the videos of what Belamundi saw. And we're getting to others that we have seen as well and how dire the situation is. Take a look. And we'll come back to that shortly. And I'm just going to show you some more videos of some of the illegal mining activities and how that has impacted on our water bodies as, as we speak. And, and we'll just take a look at some of the, the videos as we have seen um, with illegal mining and the impact that it's having, especially the Ghana Water Company Limited, for instance. This, this is the Pra River, hmm? parts of it. And the level of destruction that we're seeing um, over the period. And then also, this is the Ghana Water Company Limited, Sechre, Pramang area, the, where they, they have to shut down this treatment plant because of illegal mining activities. The central region already, the Ghana Water Company, has, has been complaining about the state of affairs there and how this is impacting on, on, their, on their activities. Stanley Mante is going to be joining us in a bit. He's a communications manager of the Ghana Water Company Limited. He'll be joining us in a bit and, and also have a quick conversation on this matter. But Awula Sewa, who is also the co-founder of Eco-Conscious Citizens, um, is joining us on Zoom as well for a quick conversation on this while we get through to uh, Bella Mundi and also um, Stanley Mante for a quick conversation on this because we understand that a number of the uh, treatment plants have broken down. I will appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us on Ghana tonight. Uh, I see this, that has it gotten to the point where Ghana Water Company is already asking that these water bodies, our water bodies in this country, should be designated as security zones, as a way of tackling the impact of illegal mining on these water bodies. Has it gotten to this point? Is it the way to go from where you sit? Yeah, we're not serious at all. We are, we are supervising the poisoning of Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. And uh, as has been said, if we were serious, we could have stopped this yesterday. But we're just holding our arms because we're either involved or complicit or persons funding uh, political parties are involved. So we do nothing. And it's criminal because poisoning people is a criminal offense. And we know what is going on and we are just folding our arms, rhetoric here and there. And uh, I think persons supervising the poisoning should be arrested and held accountable. You just can't uh, play with the lives of Ghanaians for, for a mess of pottage. I see. And, and Ola, already there's this conversation about the possible suspicion that government and the agencies meant to fight this illegal mining have turned a blind eye because we're in an election year, just some three months, less than three months to the election. And so government is just turning this blind eye intentionally so as to avoid the threat of losing votes in these areas where illegal mining is taking place, as we saw in the 2020 elections, because if we recall, the NPP had been consistent in the fact that they lost some votes in some of these consequences because of the government or the president's decision to crack down on illegal mining in its first term. Well, it's an election year, so we can vote them out for supervising the poisoning in Ghana. For me, it doesn't matter what year it is. The president put his presidency on the line seven years ago. Ghanaians have watched for seven years the situation deteriorating, deteriorating, deteriorating. And right now, it's like we're in the Wild West. Everybody just does what they like, as if there's no government. So for me, I mean, if it's an election year, then Ghanaians have a choice. They can decide whether what is currently taking place, what they want to con they want to see continue, or whether they want a change. But you see, one doesn't want a change for the sake of change. One wants to change from something, uh, whatever the situation is, to something better. So Ghanaians need to vote wisely. But for me, I would say that this stage, the plane around has to stop. Now death, rising kidney disease, and deformed. Uh, 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 
think the best thing we can do now is say that enough is enough. It's not a question of education or raising awareness. Unless you're on, um, on the planet, you know what's going on. So I like staff house and say enough is enough. We are going to go on a general strike and so you stop what is going on. If uh, all our water bodies in our forest reserves have their water bodies and to disagree with our forest reserves, if our forefathers have been responsible as we are being, would we have anything to look at? Would we have any forest? We might have to go to museums to look at what forests in Ghana look like. What is going on is totally, totally unacceptable. And I expect the Ghana Medical um, Association to and, set and, up and, and you know um, make statements the dangers of mercury poisoning. Right. They know how it affects the body. Why? Why is why the silent? I expect the church to also sit up and make statements because it's not a question of of building cathedrals. God has asked us to build. It's about the welfare of the people. We have to speak out. We have to speak out. Wrong is wrong, regardless of who is committing the wrong. We have to speak up. Wrong is wrong indeed. I will, uh, and I want you to hold on a bit for me because uh, I have Stanley Mante, who is, uh, heads the communications of the Ghana Water Company Limited, also joining us on the telephone. Mr. Mante, appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. I mean, we've seen videos of some of the treatment plants broken down as a result of the activities of illegal miners. In some of these areas, the central region is the latest, giving us a strong indication that they're having to ration water because of the impact of illegal mining activities in, in these areas, increasing the turbidity levels of the water that you have to treat. I mean, give me a picture of how bad the situation is across the country from what we are saying now. Thank you very much, um, Alfred, for having me. Um, you, 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 you know that uh, the raw water or our river bodies are, are uh, raw material for the production um, of water. So, if the raw, the raw material is contaminated, it becomes a bit difficult for, for treatment. So, for instance, uh, when we were in primary school uh, with this time, um, we, were, we were all given the characteristics of water. One to be transparent, one to be um, clear, no color, that sort of thing, you know. And uh, our raw water are also expected to have that uh, characteristic. Um, unfortunately, the raw water that we have now um, has a very dark brown color, okay, um, contaminated with um, heavy metals like mercury and cyanide, okay. And so uh, it becomes a bit difficult for us to treat the water. Now, if you have touched the water uh, for treatment, you need to add a test chemical to coagulate the silk so that you separate the, 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 the water from the silk. Okay. Now, initially we're using a chemical called uh, alum, aluminum sulfate. Now, and sometimes has, that is what we've been using. In recent times, the aluminum sulfate has proved to be ineffective. So we have had to use a more concentrated, of the, uh, a more concentrated form um, of the alum, which is uh, 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 the polymer. Okay. And then the polymer is about three to five times more expensive than the alum. And if we are if we are using a chemical which is about three to five times the original chemical, definitely it will uh, impact on the cost. Now, if apart from the polymer that we are using, yeah, uh, uh, which is expensive, we are using even more of the polymer than we are using uh, aluminium. So it makes it more expensive. So the cost goes high, the quantity goes high. And it all impacts on the cost of um, the cost of, of, of water. Stability now is rising from, uh, I mean, the normal uh, uh, that we expect right. to from let's say so between five NTU and let's say fifteen NTU to so about five between five thousand and fifteen thousand. Between okay, five thousand so and fifteen thousand. Between five thousand and fifteen thousand. Something that's supposed to be between five. Okay, single five and let's say fifteen NT now has risen to let's say five thousand to fifteen thousand NT. So so and so here's what I want us to do. Water, right. If, so, per permit me. If, if give me a, an idea of how much now is costing you to, for instance, um, purify the water that we're using now as against previously when this illegal mining was not this prevalent. Okay, I, so because um, uh, it will be a bit difficult for me to mention um, active figures now because of the rising cost of all the materials. So mm -hmm. on daily basis, uh, the cost of production is changing. 
on daily basis. Right. Um, Community is increasing, chemical cost is increasing, energy cost is going up. So it becomes a bit difficult. I don't have the data with me now. Mm. Uh, if I'd known, I would have checked and then I would have had the data, let's say, as a 10 years back, five uh, years back, and I then see. now. But the graph that, as I recollect, keeps going high. Okay. Uh, if you remember the last time, when we were working on the last time, okay, mm -hmm. and we did our calculation for production cost, it was around 30, uh, 38.5 per uh, cubic meter. Okay. Now, what did we get for the tire? The tire is less than 15 uh, cubic. It's just around 8.5 cubic per cubic meter. So look at the difference. So for every liter of water that we sell, we lose a substantial amount of, of, of money. And now it becomes increasingly more expensive. Now, a few years ago, we were pricing for tires and it's around 28.5. Now, the cost of uh, uh, materials, the cost of uh, 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 chemicals and everything has gone high, which means that if we have to compute the cost of uh, uh, water per cubic meter now, more expensive then it's going to be a that even the, 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 the technology that uh, we have computed three, three years back. And, and so the, it's quite expensive now. Uh, 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 water, water production is quite, quite expensive now. Okay. But, uh, uh, as I say, Mr. Mase, so is there any water that's clean in this country at all, as, as far as you do know? Uh, well, to the best of my knowledge, it is the river or the source that is less polluted now is the Volta River. The Volta uh, River is the one, cleanest. Yes, that is less polluted. I'm not saying it's that not is polluted. less polluted. That is less pol polluted. Uh, uh, currently, I see. and uh, and formerly we were not even using uh, much chemicals in treating water from our treatment plants that uh, abstract water from the water because the water was uh, quite good, stability and everything was okay. So we did get a little uh, filtration and then a little of uh, let's say chlorine to kill the germs, and then we are good to go. Now we are closing along in all our uh, let's say uh, 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 treatment plants dotted along the water. The Volta River, and we are using that because the Volta now is becoming polluted. Once all the tributaries into the Volta are polluted, the black Volta, the white Volta are all polluted as a result of uh, uh, illegal uh, listen, alluvial mining. Okay. I see. And so then on the Volta itself, now there's aquaculture uh, on, on, on the river. For every nautical mile on the, uh, on the Volta River, you see large farms of aquaculture. Okay, so and and then uh, what is happening is they got the use of organic feeds, including the fishes. Uh, they are droplets, and then they enrich the alluvial soil. And then it is the speedy growth of water hydrants and aquatic weeds. And these aquatic weeds also change the taste of the uh, water. And then it also changes the color of the water. So now right. we have had to close a lot of uh, those uh, along also in all our fishing plants uh, along the water okay. river. Which means mm. that production around that area is also becoming expensive um, as a see. Sad one. And that's a sad reality that we're faced with right now. Mr. Mate, uh, I appreciate your time. And in, in, in 30 seconds, I want you to under, answer this for me. How close or far are we from this threat of importing water in this country if things continue this way? Quickly. I mean, research has shown that if the rate of pollution as it is now is to continue, by 2030, we should be importing water into, the, into this country. By 2030? Now, yeah, it is compounded by climatic change, okay, and then and, and it's, it's, it's becoming increasingly more, more, uh, 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 more dangerous. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. Stanley Monte heads the communications of the Ghana Water Company Limited. 2030, if things continue this way, we would have to import water to drink in this country. That's the reality check that we're faced with now. And we're talking about 2024 is ending. So let's say let's start from 2025, five years from now, all things being equal, if things continue this way. You know, so Belamonde is joining me now, uh, my colleague, um, for a quick conversation on what she saw in the central region when she visited th that part of the country over the weekend. Then she posted something on social media. Take a look at this.
So we'll rectify that connection to um, the video that Balamode posted earlier. But fortunately, she's joining me on Zoom for a quick conversation on, on what she saw. Um, Bella, it's good to have you join us here on Ghana tonight. Um, but hold on a bit for me, if we can see that video, quick one, just to set the premise for this conversation. Take a look at this. Oh, that's, that's the shock you see there. The river beneath that bridge is the Pra River. Looking that brown. Bella, thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Now, what you saw there, and which we have been showing on television, you came face to face with what you used to see on TV until this weekend. How did that strike you? Heartbroken, honestly. I mean, the plan wasn't even to look out for the Pra River, but because we were in the central region, traveling across to another town, we knew some way, somehow, we'll definitely come into contact with the river. Now, this was just after the Ghana Water Company Limited had released that statement indicating that it was struggling to provide water to those within um, the central region and close by. And so we were literally monitoring that situation, trying to figure out what conversations people were having about it online, only to get to the Trifopasa Bridge and realize is that the water was looking that bad. And so we immediately stopped because we needed to take a video. The plan wasn't necessarily to, you know, the truth is we're not trying to create news out of it. But for some reason, the moment we stopped and we saw the state of the water, we realized it was that bad. Then we noticed there were chamfangs along um, the river body. And so there was active galamse going on. Then there was a, a man who just walked up to us and said, mekata, mekasa. And so you can tell that even the locals within the community need a lot of help. They need support because we didn't even have to ask him to speak, but he was willing to speak to us because he knew how far this would go. And this was just a call on us to come into the community and support them fight Kalamse because they cannot do it alone. And what broke my heart was the fact that he said that now they don't have access to any drinking water because all the streams are polluted, all the river bodies are polluted. And so... In the past where they would rely on, you know, the streams within the farms, you know, to hydrate themselves, this time around, they have to look for money to buy pure water to take along with them to the farms. And then the worst part is finding out that they have to water their crops with the same polluted water. And mind you, we're, they're not the only ones consuming these products. So we saw that report that indicated that they were finding mercury um, you know, in our soil. And so that was also affecting the quality of cocoa that we're producing and exporting. And then the other aspect is also the fact that a lot of people within those mining communities had started developing um, kidney failure. There were children that were being born with defects. And so the moment he mentioned that they were watering their crops with the water, it trickled down. And I realized that, so it's not only those people within those communities that are being affected, because some of these produce are also brought down to Accra and to the other big cities, and we buy those products. 
So it means that we're also consuming the poisonous uh, substances. And that should just tell you how dire the situation is. Yeah, and, and, and what we're seeing clearly gives us an idea of how dire the situation is and why we, we should all be concerned about this and continuously drum home that issue about the failed leadership in dealing with this issue of illegal mining across board, right from the local level to what we see. So this experience that we're talking about, beyond what we are told by the politician, obviously come on your program, for instance, it tells you something, does it not? Yes, absolutely. I agree. I mean, we've, we've heard the president talk about the fact that he's willing to put his presidency on the line. But mind you, you get into those communities and you realize that not much has been done. And the water was supposed to have, you know, been colorless by now, if really the president meant everything that he said. But you go in there and realize that the lands have been given out. The local people, well, some of them are involved. The others who are not involved cannot fight them because they don't have the weapons. And so you ask yourself a lot of questions. Where are all these, you know, um, excavators, et cetera? Where are they coming from? Who is bringing them in? Because that local person cannot afford an excavator. So who is buying them, bringing them into the community? Who is sanctioning these activities? Are the chiefs also involved? Or is it that they really have no power at this point? And so we see these locals who are involved in Galamse saying that, well, that's the only way because we don't have jobs. But at the same time, these locals cannot afford those kind of excavators in many cases. So there's someone up there that's making this available. You listen to some of them and they talk about how it is the leaders who even allegedly um, get the Chinese to move into these mining communities and engage in illegal mining. And so there's really nothing they can do. I asked the, the gentleman that I didn't have opinion for, no, and she said, oh, kwa, now we be so it's really beyond them. He could have said, it be a him for. the chiefs are the ones to answer. But he's, he told me to go back and ask the leaders. So if, if you really understand what he's saying, he's trying to tell you that we really have no power. It's the people at the top who are supposed to make this stop. And unfortunately, a lot of them were told, allegedly, are involved. So how do we fight this? How do we fight this? And that's where citizens' action also comes into play here. Bella, appreciate your time. Bella Mundi, thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. And I will also well, thank you as well for pre also joining the conversation on this matter, how bad this, the situation is. We've been talking about illegal mining for, for quite a while now. We're coming to terms with the reality that in the next five years, we might just be importing water into this country. Think about it. And that leads up into manifesto check on your election command center. This is not just an environmental issue, it's a political governance matter. That's why you see the political parties capturing it in their manifesto. Dennis Pabere, what are they saying? Well, so this issue of man, uh, <coughs> Galamse has been on the radar of the parties for a very long time. In fact, the Kufado led government had done a lot in this piece, except many are saying that they're not seeing the results of that lot that has been done. So by way of a verdict, I mean, the picture you see on here, yes, one of the many pictures that we have from some of the river bodies in mm -hmm. Ghana. I mean, it's not a scene that you would like to keep on the screen for a very long time. Mm -hmm. But of course, we've been asking Ghanaians and engaging on social media as to how they really think that this fight against Galamsey is either um, progressing well or otherwise. So we put up a, a poll on TV3 Ghana. How would you greet the Akufado administration's fight against illegal mining in Galamsey? Now, impressive. 6%, dreadful, 70%, tried somewhat, 7%, and I don't care, it's 80%. So those who say that the fight has, has been dreadful, as more of a, a lost fight, disastrous, is 70%. More like there's nothing to show for it. I see. But of course, like we always say that the verdict is with the people. I think tonight it's only fair to say that the verdict is what you see on the screens by way of the visuals that we've shown you, the work that Bella has done, mm -hmm. and then the picture we have on the screen. But be that as it may, it doesn't end there. 
The political parties still acknowledge that Galamse is a big deal and it has to be dealt with. So that's why when you look at the manifestos for 2024, both the NDC and the MPP have first of all acknowledged that yes, there's indeed a problem. They've also acknowledged that yes, a lot of harm has been caused already to the, mm -hmm. to the land, for which reason there needs to be a reclamation. So you'd find those things reflect in the manifestos. What so, was in there? Let's see. So when you look at the NPP, so let's start with the ruling party manifesto. Mm -hmm. They actually have a whole chapter dedicated to what they intend to do to fight Galamsey. Right. Unlike the NDC where they make their promises along the line of the mining industry, what they will do in the mining and in there you find some of the measures they will use to fight illegal mining. Continent. The MPP beyond that have specific things that they say they're going to do in targeting Galamsey. Mm. Key amongst them would be that they are going to make available the proven reserves data by the mm. Geological Survey Authority. Mind you, they've made a promise that when they come, they resource the Geological Survey Authority so that they will take data. That data would indicate where exactly our gold or our natural resources are so that miners would not have to do what they call trial and error. Is this the authority that the, the head said they need about $5 billion? For this, no, that was hydrological okay, authority. Right. So this authority is already there, it's functioning, except that the MPP is now saying that they're going to resource it so that we know how much mineral resources we have underneath. Okay. So that when they give you a concession, you know for sure that this concession I'm going for this quantity of material. There's no right. need for trial and error. So that's a promise that they've made. They've also said that they're going to simplify the small scale mining licensing regime through amendments of the law. And indeed, when you look at our current regime of the law, there are a number of things that you need to do to be able to get into the mining space, right? From getting mineral rights to getting a, even the license itself and now getting a lease and all that. They say they will simplify it, except they are not telling us in detail what they How will do the here. simplification is going to exactly. be. Exactly. They're Rose. also talking about scaling up the use of mercury-free gold catcher machine technology. These are some machines that they brought in. They think that this will, in a way, help in reducing illegal mining. Now, they also say they'll construct settlement dams to ensure safe storage and treatment of discharged water. Now, mind you, a lot of the times that you see that the water bodies are polluted, it's not exactly all the time that the mining is done inside the river bodies. Mm -hmm. There are times that it is done outside, except that they pump the dirty water into the river bodies. Yeah. So they say they'll do dams to collect this particular water. So quite a number of them. Um, if I take you to the NDC, sorry, so the NDC, yes. So the NDC also says that when they are given the mandates, first off, they will recategorize mining into small scale, medium scale, and large scale. Mm -hmm. This they see, they will regulate them accordingly. Right. Now, mind you, our existing regime also has that categorization, except it's in small scale, and then which is not small scale. They also say that they will promote sustainable small scale mining as a profitable and responsible business, especially for young people. Mm -hmm. Now, they say they are going to do this by enforcing the law and also using state of the art. This is the point where they mention the use of AI to track uh, excavators and the like. Okay. So that's one of the policies they say they will do when given the uh, opportunity to rule the country. They also want to ensure that mining operations are not conducted in unapproved areas such as water bodies and the like. I see. They haven't told us exactly how. So also, they also strengthen the capacity of mining regulatory institutions to ensure efficient and effective regulatory operations. Decentralization of regulatory and licensing processes for artisanal miners. This is more like also simplifying the law the, the, or the, the legal the regime. I mean, unless we, there's a clear establishment of the fact that there's a problem with the process of acquiring licenses now, because some CSOs in the environment space, like Arocha and others, will also say that all the layers of trying to get a license is to ensure that if you are applying for it, you're actually going to use it for what you said you were, plus yes. the fact that you're going to do it with the environment in mind. So, 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 so we have to interrogate the simplification that they are all talking about. Yeah, so essentially what they are saying is that, of course, if you take the license and you don't use it for what it's meant for, no matter how you do it, it will end up being an illegal mining. Because illegal mining simply means that you are mining not in conformity with the law. Now, the other thing they say about this simplification is that, for instance, for the MPP, they make the case that now they will let the issuance of license be the job of the Minerals Commission. As it stands now, it's only the minister who issues the license when it comes to mining. Mm. So they want to take that from that administrative head and give it to the Minerals Commission. So um, essentially, 
these are some of the highlights. I see, I see the last of, one there. Implemented what? A tree for life? Risk. Yes, reforestation policy. So like I mentioned, they acknowledge that a lot of harm has, has been done to the environment already. So in order to reclaim or to restore, this is one of the policies that they intend to do. But how different is this from the tree planting that this government is doing well, that's, every year? That's for, the, that's for the thousands of trees. NPP. This is the they NDC. Over one million trees have been. This is the NDC the version of it. So this is what they have in their manifesto. But also, interestingly, I tried to check what the MPP 2020 manifesto said about Galamsey. Right. What I saw, this 20, True. I did not see any specific thing that was said in regards to how they were going to deal with it. So it's not surprising that we see how things are the way they are. It's Previously, it's there was a clear-cut plan. That's how had Galam stop. They had amendment of the law to enhance the punishment regime yeah. and all that. But when you look at beyond in that MPP 2020 manifesto, you do not see a clear cut out plan how they intended to deal with Galamsey. And that, probably that's why I lost a lot of saying that. Because in 2020, recall, said they lost a lot of seats in this mining areas because of that first heat period, the 2017-2020, how they clamped down on illegal mining. We ban on small scale manufacturing, yeah. something different. But then again, as you always say, the verdict is with the people, is it not? Yes, the verdict is with people. What we are seeing right now is anything to go by. And our water body is being polluted. And the risk of we importing water in the next five years all things being equal. That's a problem. Big problem. Have to deal with. But the verdict, as always, is for the people. Well, we hit the streets earlier today. Joe Blaboja interacted with some members of the general public about their own verdict of the fight against illegal mining and the evidence we are seeing now. Take a look. No, I don't think so. We are not winning the fight against illegal mining. Because, I mean, most of the presidents who come in power, they promise to fight against these things, but, I mean, they don't, so they end up engaging in those things. And then recently, where you hear some of the rivers, they get polluted like the uh, river Pra. They cannot stop it. All because um, they need money. It's involved money. It's all about money. So when something is involved with money, people don't care what is destroying. Because after all, if I have the money, I can buy that I need. That, that's how I say. And then, you know, most of them that they are involved in this, mostly they don't drink from that river or they don't eat from that buy something they buy from outside the region or any part of the place that they want. Because on weekends, they are out of the place. So, I don't think we are really And um, I don't even know when we are going to win. Well, that's, that's the fact of the people there. That uh, in Kobe, meaning it's not going well. Well, coming up next, you're on Ghana tonight. Now, despite the concerns raised uh, by the National Democratic Congress about the Electoral Commission of Ghana said it is on top of the issues and will deliver a credible voters register. And, uh, and uh, that's uh, what we're going to get into right now. Uh, with some 95 days to election day, December 7, 2024. This is your election command center. Well, earlier today, the Electoral Commission denied claims that it is bloating the voters register to favor a political party. The EC insists that its register is credible and transparent. This follows concerns raised over the illegal transfer of votes during the just-ended voter exhibition exercise. Here's Dr. Eric Bosman Asari, the Deputy Commissioner of Corporate Services at the Electoral Commission. Investigations by the Commission have revealed that Voter transfers were indeed effected for 38 individuals, 
using the credentials of an electoral commission official. The commission has suspended the Pusiga district electoral officer and has invited him to respond to the commission's findings. The preparations towards the 2024 exhibition exercise, the absent voters list and the transferred voters list inadvertently included all transfers that had been done since 2020 when this register was first prepared. This understandably may have caused some anxiety to our stakeholders, as exemplified by the press conference addressed by the NDC in the Ejumaku Enyan SCM constituency of the Central Region. Well, that's Dr. Bosman. Sorry, let's stay up there on this matter. Dr. Rashid Tanko, computer, is the deputy director of elections and IT for the NDC. Joining me on Zoom, Dr. Rashid Tanko, good evening. Thank you for joining us on Ghana tonight. I'm afraid. Great. Now, the Electoral Commission admits you, got, you raised issues about some illegal voter transfers. They said, well, they've reviewed, they have admitted that indeed there was, there was some illegality. They point to some 38 voters who, whose detail were transferred illegally. Uh, and the electoral officer is being investigated now. And so they have put in place what the, uh, Dr. Bosman Asari says is the live liveliness check to ensure that the people who are transferring their votes are actually human beings and not just pictures. Does that address the issues that, that you raised? Alfred, at all, certainly not. I mean, uh, and, uh, in fact, Ghanaians must congratulate the NDC uh, for having been a check on this electoral commission all this while. Uh, you see, our, our posture has gone a long way to defend the democracy that we have in Ghana currently. When we said this about the, the inefficiencies going on at the Electoral Commission, people thought we were joking. And now today they've admitted to all that we have stated uh, previously concerning the discrepancies in the, in the register. Look, what uh, uh, Dr. Bosman was saying completely seems not to understand what the enormity of the problems in, uh, on the ground. Look, the issue about transfers that he talked about, it's already stated in Regulation 22.1 of CI-127, uh, which mm. talks about how transfers are, are done. You cannot do transfer in absentia. It's not possible. You don't do transfer in absentia. I, I see you say Regulation 22.1 of CI-127. We, we, let, let's pull that up. Let, hold on a bit for me. We're going to put that on the screen for the benefit of our viewers. This is what Regulation 22.1 um, of CI-127 says. Let's read this. It's going to be on the screen shortly. And uh, according to the detail, it says, a registered voter who before an election is resident for not less than 12 months in a constituency other than that in which the registered voter is registered may apply to the returning officer for the constituency where the registered voter is resident for the name of the voter, registered voter to be entered on the transferred voter list of a polling station in that constituency. So it mentioned the person, the registered voter coming up in person and not pictures, correct? That is what I'm talking about. It's already there. The framers of the CIA knew that people could temper transfer by using ID cards of others without their knowledge. So that's why they put the regulation in there. So they know that you cannot do transfer without appearing money and bigger against the good people of Ghana. And to for forensic audit of the IT system. You remember he mentioned that they, they added 2020 and 2023 transfer lists onto this current transfer list. Yes, yes this, he said they the in, inadvertently did so. That, that's how he described Beautiful. it. Beautiful. Alfred, all along I've been saying that we don't have mistakes in elections. There are no errors in elections. Any error is a calculated attempt to rig an election. Now, when you catch them, they say it's a mistake. When you don't catch them, it will pass. If we hadn't raised the issues, they were going to be silent because so it means their IT system is bereft of idea that you are adding a figure, you don't even know the numbers you are adding. You don't know the number of people you have registered. Don't you know the number of people you have transferred? So when you are, you, are, you are putting up the figures together and you see that the numbers are increasing astronomically, would you trigger something that something is wrong with the figure before you bring it out? Mm. Are you expecting the public to now call you to order? That is why we are asking that 
uh, an external body should do the investigation. This transfer, they just talk about the pussy guy. It might be widespread because they did similar thing during the proxy window. Nobody went through biometric processes to get his proxies through. I'm speaking with confidence. I told them in, at IPAC this, that you people, what you are doing is illegal. Your people are, are, are accepting proxies in the field without people going through biometric processes. Mm. That is that's the, the, the liveliness uh, check that we're talking about. It's in the CI. They were surprised at this happened. I said, that's what I'm saying. Your, your IT department is not helping matters. And therefore, mm. you, must, you must sit up. And today, the, 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 the chickens have come home to roost. They have accepted their guilt, and they instead of them to congratulate the NDC for mm. bringing them closer to, to reality, they were rather talking of robots. How do you call a registered robot incredible when your people are at the digital office are illegally transferred people from one constituency to another? Mm. You call this one robots. You call this one credible. And you are saying that you are not investigating. So you knew that all along, all the, the statement that they put out about credibility right. was for a fact. Right. Dr. Ashley Tanko, appreciate your time on this. And um, thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight as always. Thank you so much. It's uh, Deputy Director of IT and Elections at the NDC. This is Ghana Tonight, and this is your Election Command Center. We're back shortly after this quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight, and we remain your election command center. Coming up next, it's a domestic affair with the Wale Wale NPP, but will definitely have some implications on the fortunes of the party. That's the question that we're asking tonight, depending on how the rerun of the primary election between Dr. Kabiru Mahama and Haja Lariba goes. We focus on that tonight. And uh, there was a, a ruling earlier today, the Tamale High Court has annulled the Wale Wale New Patriotic Party parliamentary primary between Haja Lariba Zuera, the former gender minister, and Dr. Tia Abdul Kabiru Mahama, who is the economic advisor at the office of the vice president of the flag bearer of the MPP. Now, the incumbent member of parliament, Haja Lariba Abdul, filed this case at the Tamale High Court contesting the election results that declared Dr. Kabiru Tia as the winner. The order for the rerun of the primaries came through today. In fact, Hajia Lariba has been described as the sister of the flag bearer of the MPP with the vice president, Dr. Mamboud Bamiya, and Dr. Kabiru Mama is his advisor as well in his office. So it's a, it's a tight situation for, for the flag bearer of the MPP. And that's his constituency, his home constituency for that matter, the Wale Wale constituency. Let's hear from Dr. Kabiru Mahama earlier today after that high court ruling. Take a look. I just want to thank my legal team. They have demonstrated very well that in this case was a case that was supposed to be won by our team. Not just on the law, but on the facts of the case. Like Council rightly mentioned, we brought evidence. People engaged in the malpractice support. They were procured by the same person benefiting from this result or this particular ruling. I cannot see in the form of wicked injury. Than this. The court is a citadel of justice. The court is supposed to be a fortune of the 25 moral rights of our country. If there's moral not being upheld, I wonder what we are going to be doing in the, in the law of Taliban. The people are always to the post. If there's anyone who thinks that there's going to be an otherwise communication by the people of Malawi, I'm just a person like Be dreaming because the will of the people, they say the voice of the people is the voice of God. You cannot change it. That's uh, Dr. Kabiru Mama. They talked about the voice of the people. Samson Ladia, in any way, is also a private legal practitioner, is a lawyer of Dr. Kabiru Mama, who is also an economic advisor to the vice president of the MPP Flagra. He had this to say after the court ruling. More than 12 times, over a dozen times, of all exchanges between them. When we asked those people to come to court and to testify, they were threatened. But two of them were bold and came forward and testified. 
Well, next to speak was the lawyer for Hajia Lariba, uh, Sylvester Asong, who commended the outcome of this ruling. He said it is actually justice prevailing. Take a look. Uh, Wale Wale constituency, that will take us this far, okay? Because that is the home constituency of the presidential candidate of the MP. okay? But it's better late than never. So we believe that the party at the moment can even disregard what has happened in court. The party has the constitutional mandate to reopen nominations and even disregard the two candidates and invite other people who are willing to come forward. Well, that's Silva Sasang, is the lawyer for Haji Alariba. He talked about the party taking a decision. In fact, the party has taken a decision. The MPP today issued a statement indicating that they are reopening, in fact, they're going to rerun that primary in the Wale Wale constituency. They're reopening nominations tomorrow, between tomorrow and Thursday. And the, the primaries will be done on Sunday, September 8. So already the party is not wasting any time. They've kickstarted the process of getting either a candidate, a new candidate, or if those two have to contest. But this is what has been happening in the Balewale constituency over the period. This whole, the primary took place on the 27th of January this year. The, then on the 29th of January, two days after, the, the incumbent MP Hajjal Lariba, who, who lost this contested election, went to court, sued the national leadership led by Evans Dimako, tried to get them to settle this matter out of court. It did not happen. It traveled into the month of May. The Tamale High Court ordered for the election materials to be brought to the court. Then in June 2024, the court indeed uh, placed an injunction on Dr. Kabiru to stop carrying himself as a candidate elect for the NPP in the Wale Wale constituency. And today, the court has delivered that judgment that there has to be a rerun of that parliamentary primary for the MPP in the home region of the vice president, the flag bearer of the party, Dr. Mahmoud Obamia. And these two persons who went at each other in court are related to the vice president in many ways. Well, stay with us here in your election command center. Tomorrow we have a conversation on this plus more going into the election 94 days away from today. My name is Alfred Akonsi. On behalf of the rest of the team, thank you for staying with us here on Ghana.